Hello, everyone, and welcome to Heritage Foundation. I'm Andrew Parks, the Assistant Director of Lectures and Seminars. Uh, thank you for joining us today in the Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. I just wanted to take this opportunity to remind everyone to please silence your cell phones and encourage anyone who's watching online to submit questions by emailing speaker at heritage.org. Additionally, the recorded video of this program will be posted on the website for anyone's future reference or to share in the future. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the host of today's program. He is the Senior Research Fellow for Defense Programs, focusing on naval warfare and advanced technologies here at the Heritage Foundation in the Center for National Defense. It is my pleasure to introduce Thomas Callender. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, it is my honor today to be able to host and introduce the Honorable Dr. John Lehman. I had just entered the Naval Academy in the summer of 1986 when uh, the events that Dr. Lehman will talk about here in Ocean's Adventure were in uh, full swing. And uh, when I had to memorize my Navy chain of command, uh, he was at the top of that, uh, that chain of command. Uh, Pennsylvania native, Dr. Lehman holds a Bachelor of Science from St. Joseph's University. Bachelor of Arts and Master's Degrees from Cambridge University and a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. For more than two decades, he flew various tactical aircraft in the Naval Reserve. He's a founding partner and chairman of the J.F. Lehman and Company. From 1981 to 1987, he served as a Secretary of the Navy for President Reagan, where he was a driving force behind implementing the nation's new maritime strategy and building the 600-ship Navy. In addition, he was a Naval Flight Officer in the Reserves for 30 years, achieving the rank of Captain, and he had the unique opportunity to witness the Cold War and this new maritime strategy as not only the sector of the Navy, but actively flying fleet exercises as an A-6 bombardier navigator. He served on numerous boards and organizations, as well as being an award-winning author of several books on naval strategy and history. He was also a member of both the 9-11 Commission and the National Defense Commission. As Dr. Lehman will talk about today, Ocean's Venture is not simply a history lesson of what happened in the Cold War in the 1980s, but many of the challenges faced by the U.S. Navy today uh, resonate with what he talks about here today. Please welcome the Honorable John Lehman. Thank you for that uh, very nice uh, uh, introduction that my mother wrote for you. I appreciate it. <laughs> So uh, it's great to be back here. It's daunting to walk in, though, uh, uh, immediately to see the bust of my first roommate here in, in <laughs> D.C. So I have to be careful what I say, from, particularly after the hearing yesterday. So um, it, it, uh, it, it's really uh, it, it's, it's it, interesting. To, to see history not repeating itself, but rhyming. And people often ask me, you know, well, why did, why did you write this book? You know, it's a, it's a pretty uh, uh, old topic, really, if you will, the Cold War. What's that, if you ask a millennial? What's that about? Uh, well, it's because nobody else w wrote it. <laughs> and it's an important story. It really is an important story. And it's uh, a story that uh, needs to be told, but was uh, difficult to tell. The story itself, I could have written the book in, in six months, but to, uh, since it goes against the accepted wisdom of how the Cold War ended, uh, it, had to be, it had to be absolutely backed up with uh, available uh, hard evidence in the records citations, uh, interviews, quotes, uh, and uh, I had uh, uh, one of uh, my uh, uh, principal strategic uh, uh, thinkers and helpers who worked for me when I was SECNAV, Peter Schwartz, who ma many of you I'm sure know, uh, he was my policeman. He, wouldn't, he would not let me write anything that he could not find a citation for. And, you know, I would say, Peter, I was there. I know. <laughs> I wrote it. And uh, he would say, sorry, can't put it in. It's, it's classified. So it really took us 10 years to get 
uh, get the enough material declassified, uh, particularly uh, with regard to what we knew from uh, particularly in technical intelligence, uh, what the Russian reaction was to what we were doing, because that was that was quite key, and it was something the president depended on uh, heavily, but it was all highly classified. So anyway, that's why and how uh, uh, we did the book, took 10 years to get all that stuff done. So uh, let me just give you a quick background. I'm not going to give you too much detail because I want you to buy the book, so you'll have to uh, look up all these things. Uh, it's a, per, it's a pretty good read uh, because I put all the notes and uh, citations at the end of the book, so you don't have to go there if you don't want to. But uh, it, it, it's, uh, uh, it, it's a story that really starts uh, uh, with the Vietnam, uh, the end of the Vietnam War, and uh, the Watergate Congress, and the uh, the, the uh, laws that were passed at that time, and the shift, uh, uh, the change of American strategy and NATO strategy that uh, had been underway for a while but uh, was precipitated uh, uh, by the, the Watergate events. And that was a kind of defeatism in the West. And uh, uh, the the uh, strategy for that underlay the Cold War for NATO and the West was containment. That we uh, we organized with NATO and CETO and CENTO to stop the Soviet advances, and uh, it worked uh, it worked quite well. Uh, but <clears throat> gradually, the enormous overbearance of conventional power in Europe. Uh, became uh, more and more the focus and f eventually the sole focus of uh, SHAPE headquarters and NATO headquarters. 180 Soviet divisions fully mobilized and ready on, uh, on the border, uh, the Iron Curtain border, and uh, another 100 uh, fully equipped reserve uh, divisions behind that, and the most NATO could ever really uh, uh, deploy in all during the Cold War was 40 divisions. So it was clear that really the, the, the strategy had to be how do we how do we delay them getting to the uh, to the English Channel? And the pessimists said they'll get to the English Channel in a week despite what we do. And uh, uh, the optimists said that it might, it might take them four weeks. But so the answer obviously had to be, how are we going to, what are we going to do to stop them if we're not, if NATO is unwilling to deploy uh, a, a weight capable of absorbing that and, and defeating that kind of attack? So the answer was flexible response. Flexible response was the resort then to tactical nuclear weapons. And I'm, I'm not, not really talking about uh, the nuclear mines and uh, nuclear artillery, we were really battlefield nuclear weapons, <clears throat> but the intermediate range weapons that were to be uh, uh, used as uh, the Soviets advanced across Europe. And of course, the Soviets never accepted that, it, the, 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 it was, they, they just never took it seriously because, uh, obviously, if we were in their position, we wouldn't either because uh, uh, those intermediate nuclear weapons were falling on Western Soviet uh, 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 territory. So they never recognized a, uh, a, a firebreak between strategic and tactical. Once the war went nuclear, um, they, they believed it would go all the way. And so they did not believe and were not deterred by flexible response because their intelligence knew very well the weaknesses of Western democracies when it came to first use of nuclear weapons. <clears throat> and while within the uh, different military ministries, 
the, the uniform militaries uh, had a, a fully fleshed out doctrine to use them. The Russians did not believe that any European or American uh, leader would ever go nuclear first, that they would negotiate. They would first negotiate. And so that gave the Soviets a tremendous uh, self-confidence. And they felt that balance, what they called the correlation of forces, enabled them to use uh, to political advantage uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, tremendous conventional uh, balance. So that, that was the, uh, the source of the Brezhnev Doctrine uh, uh, and uh, their uh, professed and uh, advertised uh, willingness and indeed intention to intervene in any country where socialism, communism was, uh, uh, was being challenged. And that led to their uh, tremendous increase uh, during the uh, late 60s and 70s uh, of uh, funding, uh, support to, uh, to the Sandinistas and to the Cubans and to the uh, interventions in Africa and uh, really throughout Latin America. And so uh, there, the, the, the balance was shifting. And that led to a kind of defeatism within NATO uh, circles, which, which, uh, which really um, manifested itself uh, as the, the, the urge to, for detente. And uh, the Western democracies shifted their foreign policies really to uh, to pursue their detente, to make concessions, to um, not to rebuild or build up any further their militaries, uh, and to negotiate uh, increasingly a broad range of uh, of uh, uh, concessions uh, uh, and uh, arms control agreements to um, to try to solve the problems and the threat from this. Uh, Tension on deck. The admiral is on the bridge. <laughs> hey, Ed. I was just saying I've been uh, I've been so nervous coming in and finding my roommate's bust as you walk <laughs> through the door. So, uh, uh, but uh, welcome aboard. So, in, in any case. This defeatism was not shared by a broad range of intellectuals and uh, professionals <clears throat> and statesmen, largely in what's, what used to be called the realist school uh, of, uh, uh, of national security policy. The uh, geopoliticians like Kissinger and uh, uh, Sam Huntington at Harvard and uh, Robert Strauss at Pei and Bill Kintner at Penn and uh, uh, that was a broad school. And Ronald Reagan got very interested in them after he lost the nomination in 76. And he embarked on a, uh, a, a fairly in-depth uh, graduate program to really understand the, the intellectual foundations of, of a, a different approach than what was the orthodoxy through the West at the time. And so he traveled and met uh, with uh, the leaders in Europe, uh, particularly people that shared his worldview, like Helmut Schmidt in Germany and Maggie Thatcher in the UK and others in, uh, in Asia. And uh, he read deeply during those, uh, those years. And uh, then when he announced that he was running for the nomination again in 77. And he was asked, well, if you become president, what's your Cold War strategy? And that's when he famously said, my strategy will be straightforward and simple. We win, they lose. And he really believed that. And of course, he was ridiculed by the establishment and the intelligentsia, so-called, and this cowboy, this B, uh, B film actor doesn't understand the nuances of, uh, of policy making and, uh, and he was ridiculed. But he had really done his homework and he had brought around him advisors 
help him put together a plan to move from containment to a forward strategy that involved rollback, intellectual rollback and political rollback instead of just containment. And uh, he, he was very impressed with work that was going on and long-term policy uh, going on at the Naval War College and elsewhere uh, uh, on naval strategy. Because since, since the 19th century, well, really before that, uh, naval culture and naval doctrine was n not defense, the only defense was offense. That was uh, the foundation of Arthur, uh, Alfred Thayer Mahan. Uh, it was why Teddy Roosevelt built, his, built the fleet to what it was. It was command of the seas, unapologetic maritime supremacy. This was a word, by the way, that got banned in the American government and in Brussels for almost 20 years. I mean, in the Carter administration, it was prohibited to use the term maritime superiority, even to quote Mahan uh, and, and use command of the seas, because this was disruptive to detente. And uh, as a, uh, uh, another manifestation of that policy, there was uh, a prohibition against the, taking the annual Navy exercises north of the GI-UK gap, the Greenland, Iceland, UK uh, continent. Uh, gap became a kind of Maginot line. And while some naval ships uh, combatants were, did go up there into the Norwegian Sea and into the northern Pacific waters, never as a large formation. Single, double ships, uh, but never, never major exercises. And there were major exercises uh, all through the Cold War every year uh, in NATO. But they were, uh, and I'm talking hundreds of naval ships, but they were prohibited from going north in those exercises, uh, north of the GIUK gap. And they, uh, the exercises were useful practices, underway replenishment and integration of communications and so forth uh, between the NATO navies, but never any uh, real strategic thinking behind those exercises. It was all tactical. So Reagan really believed during the campaign that this was fundamental uh, to uh, ending the Cold War, that we had to change our uh, uh, strategic thinking. We had to use the tremendous advantage that NATO had, which was ignored. In, in Brussels and shape, and that was geography. Brussels and shape and all the NATO planning meetings, and I see people, a, a fair number of people here who have attended these NATO ministerials and uh, the nuclear planning group and so forth. It was obsessively focused myopically on the Fulda Gap, the North German Plain, and the conventional uh, uh, land balance. The seas were something that, you know, uh, the Navy needs to bring the beans and bullets, but there's nothing else they can do to affect uh, the, the North German plane. And so uh, this, uh, this was a, a, a weird kind of uh, total uh, refusal to look at a map, because Anybody looking at a Mercator projection can see that the Warsaw Pact was a landlocked uh, alliance, nearly all of it above the 50th parallel, which is lousy geography uh, for agriculture, which was why Russia uh, depended throughout the Cold War for 85% of its foodstuffs from uh, the free world. And they had essentially no warm water ports. They, had, uh, 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 they were surrounded by the seas. And, and it was the NATO navies who historically and traditionally commanded those seas. And this is, there were a few people like Admiral Gorshkov to, who understood this and were able to get, having served as chief of the Navy for 30 some years, was able to get support to 
take command of the seas so that they could not be used against, uh, against the Soviet Union. But uh, inherently, the great navies of the world were, uh, were the NATO navies and the uh, uh, Japanese and uh, other allies in, in Asia. So this was a huge advantage, a geopolitical advantage, that NATO was ignoring. And so uh, Reagan ran on a platform. If you look up uh, the 1980 uh, Republican platform, it is built on the national security side on the 600-ship Navy and maritime supremacy. That was the major plank that he ran on in, in the foreign policy side of, uh, of the campaign. And it wasn't just the Republicans at all. In fact, there were as many Democrats who helped put this strategy together, led by people like Scoop Jackson and, uh, uh, and uh, John Stennis and uh, uh, many of the longstanding uh, uh, leaders in the House. Uh, because there were, at the time, uh, a, a very strong non-naval uh, uh, and, and non-defense-oriented uh, Republicans, like Clifford Case and many others. That, uh, so it was really a, a bipartisan majority, not a Republican minority. It wasn't polarized the way it is today. And, uh, uh, and really, that's how it succeeded, because when Reagan won the election, he immediately started implementing it, and uh, he, uh, uh, we, uh, with the help of many of the people here and uh, that have spoken here, uh, like Bill Schneider and others, the program had been fully uh, costed out. Uh, budgets had been drawn up before the election uh, that were well costed out for rebuilding the Navy, rebuilding the Air Force with the, M, M, uh, uh, with the M, uh, uh, MX missile, uh, with the backfire bomber. The Army was to be expanded and was expanded to 20 divisions. So it was across the board. But uh, it was the Navy that was the major thrust to use the vulnerability, use the Navy to prove to the Soviets that they had huge vulnerabilities that NATO had been ignoring. And so uh, uh, during the transition in meetings, uh, he asked, what can we do to show the Soviets that, we, that this is really a fundamentally change in NATO strategy? This is not just a cam this is not campaign rhetoric. This is a real change that's going to end the Cold War. How can we do that right away? And so by then, we had a program to take uh, the, uh, the annual exercises. That year, they had different names, but that year it was called Ocean Venture, hence the name of the book. Uh, and uh, some 220 ships uh, from all the NATO navies. And to take that, the, the uh, North Atlantic part of that exercise, and instead of cowering below the GIUK gap, to turn left in the Davis Channel and go north. And so he really liked that. And he said, uh, yeah, let's do that. But I, I said at the time, Mr. President, uh, President elect, there's, there's a uh, little difficulty here. You also have to let us uh, not tell the JCS and, uh, and not tell NATO, because there are 6,000 bureaucrats in the JCS, and it will leak. It will yeah. be guaranteed to leak. And then you'll have to deal with the, uh, with the public debate. The chiefs will then say, we will study it and come back in five years or so. And uh, uh, so, uh, he, so you have to let us just do this Navy and Air Force alone. Uh, because the Air Force had, had been fully integrated into naval strategy with the B-52s equipped for mining and for harpoon missiles and, and with the F-15s fully integrated in the air defense of uh, Norway and so forth. Uh, and uh, <coughs> he said, uh, uh, so we have to 
just do it alone. And he said, well, how can you, can you do this without uh, telling, telling them? And he said, yeah, because first of all, no one in the Joint Staff and no one in NATO cares about what the Navy does. They're, they, you know, <laughs> as long as they're going to be the truck drivers during the war. They don't understand what navies are. A lot of them think that ships are really solid, not hollow, like their <laughs> toy boats. They don't have no idea what goes on in these exercises. <clears throat> and he said, well, what about, the, what about the European allies? And I said, it's even safer there because the Royal Navy never tells the Ministry of Defense what they're doing, and that's true of nearly all of the European uh, governments. And so, uh, so he said, okay, let's do it. So we had the start on uh, the uh, 26th of August. Uh, we uh, sortied 82 ships out of Norfolk because the Europeans had, had come over. We had uh, two carriers, two U.S. carriers, and uh, 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 five or so uh, fairly large deck uh, uh, helicopter carriers from Europe and the Invincible class uh, jump jet carrier. And we turned left and went through the Davis Strait. And the first the Soviets knew we were up there was when Ace Lyons, who was kind of the Navy's Patton, uh, who we'd appointed uh, as, the, uh, uh, as the strike fleet commander, he sent a, a flight of four F-14s, four A-6Es, and four K-60 tankers a thousand miles from the carrier because he had intelligence that the Russians, Russian Navy was doing a major exercise right off uh, of Murmansk. And first they knew that there was a carrier in the Norwegian Sea was when this flight of 12 aircraft blew through the middle of their exercise at 550 knots. And it just blew the Soviets' mind. They had, this was inconceivable to them. Where did these come from? Obviously, they were carrier jets, so they knew the carrier had to be there somewhere. And so they launched everything. They, they, every aircraft they could get off the ground, every ship, and uh, uh, it, it was, uh, it just totally uh, blew their mind. And they, uh, they didn't really get a paint on one of the carriers uh, until a week after they were up there. And uh, it was because Ace especially had, had long been cover and deception, and he had uh, worked uh, to uh, equip a ship that could put all of the emanations of, of a full battle group, uh, the sonar, the, the uh, communications, the, uh, the, all of the radars, the screw noises and everything into the water. And, uh, and it was very effective, very, uh, 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 very much a part of uh, uh, of the overall strategy. So uh, that uh, uh, that became the template for the next six years. Uh, we ran these uh, these exercises bigger and more complex every year. We took the lessons learned because we had about a hundred ops analysts with every uh, exercise. We analyzed it put it up uh, into the war games every summer, the global war games at Newport, and uh, refined them, figured out what worked, what didn't work, what tactics were effective, and, uh, and built them into the next, uh, the next exercise. We did it in the North uh, Pacific uh, just uh, three months after we did it in the Atlantic and the Norwegian Sea. Uh, running mock attacks uh, right up to Vladivostok and uh, Petropavlovsk because the whole purpose was to show the Soviets they couldn't stop us. They could not stop us. And, uh, and that we not only could neutralize their naval power and their defenses, but we could then strike deeply into uh, the Soviet Union itself against their strategic targets, and there was nothing they could do to stop us. Well, this was a huge change because the Soviets had counted, if the war started, from moving all of their forces in, in the, the Eastern Soviet Union to reinforce NATO. And so suddenly they were faced with the fact that they 
they couldn't, they couldn't move any uh, forces uh, to uh, support their invasion of, of NATO. And, uh, and, and it just created real, uh, real turmoil. Year after year we did this, everyone became more effective. Uh, and it culminated in 85 and 86. And in 85, we, for the first time ever, put an aircraft carrier, full aircraft carrier, into the Norwegian fjords and operated the air wing uh, consistently, a full air wing running strikes through the Norwegian mountains right up to the Swedish border. Then we'd always pop up and put the IFF on so the Soviets knew we were there. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and they were never able to, in, in uh, 86, we did it again, and even in a more, using more sophisticated uh, uh, technology, and uh, it just, they, they didn't know what to do. They never saw, they never got a paint, though, despite having their entire northern fleet and all their aircraft, they never got a paint on a carrier in the fjord. And uh, uh, it was, uh, it just fundamentally changed their entire thinking uh, of what, you know, what the, the, the balance really was. And we found out later through intelligence and then openly at, the, at an Oslo uh, or a photo conference, they were quite open and told us that we never were able to uh, keep the Northern Fleet operational for more than a week in those exercises, because they had their own ops analysts uh, there. And uh, so they sent a demarche to the Politburo in 86, saying we must treble the budget for the Northern Fleet and the North, uh, Northern Air Force, uh, or we cannot defend the homeland for more than a week. And that hit like, a, like an explosion in the Politburo. And it was just what Gorbachev uh, was looking for because that enabled him because the, the, he was under he he more than anyone knew that the Soviet economy was collapsing. I mean, it, it was just trying to keep up, and this was the heart of uh, of Reagan's genius in that he he truly believed that their economy and their culture was so inefficient that they. It, with just a minor increase of a couple of percentage points on our defense spending, expanding all of the, the capabilities of the services, that and and of course, he had another layer. It's interesting. He's he, during the transition, in one of the meetings, um, the uh, uh, CIA director had uh, uh, had had who was a big advocate of psychological warfare, had, had gotten uh, uh, the president uh, very much interested in psychological warfare. And he said at one of these meetings, OK, we're, we are going to make all of the services 10 feet tall, but we're going to make the Soviets think that they're 15 feet tall. So there was an overlay of psychological warfare initiatives uh, that uh, uh, the Soviets had a hard time figuring out what was real and what wasn't, and so they tried to match uh, match all of them. Uh, Star Wars being the most prominent and eventually the most effective. Uh, and the president, uh, in a couple of years, uh, came to be a true believer in Star Wars, not as a psychological add-on, but as a real program. And it didn't matter whether it was real or not because the Soviet military uh, believed it, it was real. And they demanded that they have their own Star Wars program. So Gorbachev was faced with these demands. Where they were already, we now know, even though CIA was saying they were only spending you know, 8 to 12 percent of the GDP, we, we now know they were spending almost 45 percent of their GDP. And now they're getting new demands from, the, uh, from their military uh, to fund huge increases. So this is really the straw that broke the camel's back. And it gave Gorbachev, Gorbachev, uh, when, uh, as a result of the Northern Wedding Exercises, the, uh, uh, the, the 
uh, general staff was demanding uh, three uh, times the budget for the Northern Fleet, he not only said no to that, he cut the budget and ordered that we move into a more defensive, we the Soviets, move into a more defensive posture, not trying to interdict uh, in the West, bring these attack submarines back, pull the SSBNs under the ice cap, uh, and, um, and stop trying to be offensive. And that's when they had launched this huge initiative around the world for naval arms control. And uh, uh, that was, um, uh, and, and <clears throat> it's, uh, uh, it, it led soon to a coup d'etat attempt, of which you, you may all recall. More of the details of it that were classified are in the book. Uh, and that, in turn, the fact that they were able fairly easily to defeat the coup attempt enabled Gorbachev to purge the, all of the services of people who were not his supporters, uh, which were most of, most of the top, uh, top leaders. And so that enabled him to s sit down seriously uh, with President Reagan and start to negotiate, uh, uh, really. But he was still, of course, that led to Vladivostok. Uh, and uh, his, his two top priorities were uh, naval cutbacks and, above all, uh, stop uh, Star Wars, SDI. And that's when Reagan said no and walked away. And uh, that forced the Soviets then to negotiate seriously. And uh, um, that was the end of the Cold War. And uh, uh, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Thank you. Distinguished audience. So you mentioned uh, history not repeating itself but rhyming, and uh, that came back to me uh, throughout the book as, as I read it, uh, and it I think definitely resonates today, right? And you say of people, uh, prevailing attitude of you know foreign policy, I think even you see internationally now of you know appeasement, containment for some of these you know bad actors, people around whether Russia, North Korea even some of the things that China is doing, very aggressive um, around the world. And, uh, and also, if you look at you know, some of the threats now today, this more modern capabilities, you know, long-range missile sets, uh, space-based ISR, and, and many will say that, oh, it's, it's an unwinnable war, right? The Navy carriers are um, obsolete. We can't, we can't uh, you know, fight back. Um, and, but looking back you know, at this and then looking towards today, I've been interested in your thoughts of this, and, and should, you know, the Navy is, and the nation is starting to do some more, um, more complex exercises with ball tops, but do we need to take, a, you know, kind of up it a few steps and go back to much more complex uh, joint exercises that are really pushing new strategies uh, in the war fighting proficiency, and some of those that would, and your point of whether uh, some may think this is much more escalatory on that piece. I'd be interested in your well, a very good, simple question. <laughs> uh, it's, um, uh, you know, uh, no, underlining Ronald Reagan's strategy was not to uh, defeat the Soviet Union, not to build a military uh, that uh, could enable uh, uh, attacking and bringing down, um, but to make it clear to the Soviets that they could not win by going to the military, to deter. Uh, and deterrence is a simple concept, but it's a very valid one, just as applicable today. Deterrence is just uh, making it clear uh, to an adversary that if they attempted to use military power to their advantage and our disadvantage, that they would suffer far more than they could gain. And uh, uh, that's what underlay Reagan's forward strategy, and it succeeded because it soon became clear that they could not defend the homeland from 
all azimuths around the world where naval power could be projected uh, could be projected in naval and air power, uh, and uh, uh, that's what we have to reestablish today. That's what we don't have today. That's why uh, we've uh, the, the, the basic problem with the disturbers of the peace today: China, Russia, uh, North Korea, Iran, is they perceive that they can gain advantage without cost or with an acceptable cost. And that's what we have to remove. Now, it doesn't take the kind of buildup that Ronald Reagan uh, brought about in our military capability. Uh, we have to increase uh, the capabilities because the threats we face today are very different than the Cold War. These are not existential threats. Whatever China may become, it is not today or really in the foreseeable future an existential threat to the United States the way the Soviet Union was, and certainly none of the le lesser, uh, uh, lesser uh, adversaries are. So what we have to do is rebuild that capability. Uh, today, we are not deterring because we let, uh, let's just focus on the naval uh, forces, we let the naval forces shrink from 594 ships to about 240 at the low point. And uh, that is why they all started running into each other. And uh, uh, you know, to terribly mix a metaphor, we have been running our fleet into the ground. Uh, maintenance deferred, maintenance not done, ships deploying uh, without having ready uh, combat systems, uh, no training. They, they did away with uh, the school for surface warfare officers because they had to send them straight to the fleet. They didn't have enough uh, manpower. Training just kind of collapsed. And, uh, and so we lost the edge and we lost, uh, lost the, the mission capability quite apart from the numbers of ships. It was the numbers that, for, that brought about this tremendous erosion during the period particularly of sequester when uh, we had no defense bills at 11 straight continuing resolutions. And, and, uh, and so uh, it's, not, uh, it's not rocket science and it's not a massive increase in, in budget breaking spending to restore uh, the size of the Navy to be big enough to do the things that the combatant commanders demand of them and to uh, restore the training and readiness. It's going to take, it obviously is going to take a steady increase, but uh, not on the scale of uh, Ronald Reagan. As to the kinds of ships we have and uh, uh, are building, the issue of vulnerability of surface ships, of course all surface ships uh, are, are, are vulnerable. Uh, 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 they're not as vulnerable as land bases, you know, Air Force bases, Army divisions. Uh, every kid has the has the uh, lat longs of uh, Fort Bragg and uh, uh, all, all of the uh, uh, Army and Air Force bases around the world, and they can't move. At least our small fleet can move at 30 to 35 knots and use cover and deception, and so they're harder to kill. Carriers, it, it, there's nothing new in the carrier debate. The first, uh, first claims that carriers were too vulnerable to spend money on was in 1917 when the British launched the first full <laughs> aircraft carrier. And every year, the same tired old arguments, oh, they're so, oh, well, you know, the Germans have these new bombers or they have the submarines or the new torpedoes. The real, the worst threat the Navy ever faced uh, from missiles was at Okinawa, where the fleet couldn't use the mobility. They, uh, they were stuck in the, the bays around, uh, 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 around Okinawa because they had to support the, the troops that were ashore. And the kamikaze threat, uh, which had much smarter guidance than any missile system today, um, were an enormous threat, and they came in waves and numbers constantly, 100 straight days of 24-hour attacks. They would come in sea skimming 20 feet uh, uh, over the water. Uh, they would come in sea skimming and then pop up and dive vertically down where they studied where the 
the fire arcs of the defensive ships were. And, uh, and so we lost 35 destroyers went to the bottom in that battle. Four aircraft carriers were essentially put out of action, uh, but we had more than a dozen. Uh, none of them were sunk, by the way, because the, the later carriers in the war <coughs> Uh, were you know thirty thousand tons and uh, uh, and and today of course they're hundred thousand tons. You take a Nimitz class carrier today, the only thing it's you can really kill one uh, with is an a, a atomic weapon, a, a nuclear weapon. The Nimitz class has three uh, has triple uh, HY one hundred armored decks. It's got a thousand watertight compartments. It's got seven layers of side protection around the entire ship, and uh, uh, nobody would notice if an Exocet hit, the, hit a Nimitz class, because it couldn't penetrate more than about three of the, of the alternating different materials that protect it. It's got triple hulls underneath for, uh, for, uh, uh, t against torpedoes. Sure, it can be put out of action with enough hits, and anything can, but it's still the best and most optimum platform for deploying, you know, as we, we uh, used them in the Haiti crisis uh, during the Reagan years, uh, to transport the uh, Army Airborne Divisions. They took the air wings off and put the helicopters and all the support equipment and, and uh, uh, the vehicles uh, of, the, of two uh, divisions of uh, Army units. In, uh, in the immediate response to 9-11, there were no uh, available Air Force bases to, to uh, support an attack into Afghanistan at the time. And so the Kitty Hawk was deployed with the Army Rangers and the SEALs and the Air Commandos uh, for the initial attacks on Tora Bora and the attempts to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to get uh, uh, Osama bin Laden. Uh, so a carrier is just a movable, survivable piece of, of uh, American sovereignty. And uh, to do away with them because there are new kinds of missiles uh, is silly. Because, the, you know, it, there's been a seesaw uh, back since the Stone Age on offense versus defense, new breakthroughs in offensive weapons. Uh, give them an advantage to the offense for a certain amount of time, and then the defensive systems uh, take over. A typical a carrier battle group has seven layers of defense that a missile has to get through before it, it actually hits. And the closer into the key targets it gets, the thicker and denser the, the defenses become. The real issue today is cyber. That is the biggest vulnerability that we face. We do have pretty good offensive capability, uh, but it is here that there are vulnerabilities that are difficult to cope with. And particularly as we've moved all of our services to into uh, network warfare and distributed uh, uh, data and, uh, uh, and without really uh, fallbacks, um, you talk to a soldier in Afghanistan and ask him, where's your map? You, this is your objective, where's your map? We don't need a map, we've got, we've got my little GPS here. Uh, in the Navy, they don't teach, uh, uh, they don't teach uh, celestial navigation anymore, as you know. Did you take it? Oh, yes, I did, sir. Yeah, I, <laughs> I had to practice with that. And, and you may be called back to active duty. <laughs> uh, Even in my submarines, we still practice uh, <laughs> shooting the stars. Yeah, well, uh, uh, we, we, have, uh, we have these vulnerabilities that we did not build a graceful uh, uh, degradation into our systems because who knew, you know? And now we know that cyber, there is no, no digital system that cannot be attacked through cyber. So this is a whole new level of challenge that has to be done. But to say that we've got, we can't waste money on building the Navy up uh, because we've got to spend on these much more uh, uh, arcane and technically difficult uh, uh, challenges is, 
you know, if, if you're not there, you can't do anything. And, you know, the exactly. stupid arguments that, uh, uh, around, uh, uh, oh, we don't need, we don't need a 355 ship Navy because our, our, each of our combatants today is, is far more capable with far more sophisticated technology than they ever had before. And, uh, but it, if they ain't there, it doesn't matter. Exactly. A ship can only be in one spot at once. Yeah, and the fact is we, are, we now face uh, real potential threats in more areas than we did during the, the Cold War. And uh, we, we are very vulnerable, uh, totally dependent on a very integrated trade uh, network around the world. And this is really why the Chinese, we brought about the Chinese naval buildup, and they were very, very, very clear uh, about it. After we did the 40 percent uh, cuts on our defense budget, after the, we won the Cold War, uh, the Chinese, uh, and we had lots of interaction with the top Chinese uh, thinkers and leaders. Uh, I, I was over there twice. and. Everybody I met with, and from the top, and the general staff, and the intelligence bureaus, they were all Caltech and UCLA and Stanford grads, all with very nice Italian suits and uh, <laughs> uh, very bright people. And they were very frank. They said, "Look, you know, we're we are far more dependent than you are on uh, on uh, the seas, uh, all of our foodstuffs and technology. Eighty-five percent of all of us." comes through these straits of Sunda and Malacca and, and uh, uh, through the South China and East China Seas. And, uh, and you're not here. You used to be here. We never see a carrier anymore. And, and you know, uh, it's, there are no naval ships visible anywhere in the Pacific. And so, uh, and we know, you know, we follow your politics very closely. We know you're not going to rebuild this Navy that you are uh, dismantling. And so we had depended on uh, a certain stability in the, in the Pacific, which is now disappearing. Uh, you can't even stop the pirates in the Indian Ocean. And so we're going to build a 600-ship Navy ourselves. We'll build it. And we have to command the seas really all the way out to Hawaii. You can have Hawaii. <laughs> I said, wouldn't you be interested in California? <laughs> we might negotiate there. But, uh, uh, they, uh, they were uh, not, you know, uh, this is not bellicosity that, uh, uh, that built it. Now, you know, the appetite comes with the eating. And as they're now beginning to deploy uh, a real Navy, there are definitely advocates to say, hey, yeah, we do need Hawaii. And, um, uh, so uh, it's uh, it's really a uh, uh, it's a challenge we have to meet, not just there, but in every one of the adversaries we have. We have to be able to deploy sufficient power visibly, and you can't just say, "Oh, we've got it," and now we've got we've got uh, ten carriers, and uh, the fact that they never leave port is uh, uh, a, a side issue. You have to have real power. You have to go show it. You've got to trained to do it and prove to them that you can do it and they can't. And that's, that's what it's all about. All right. Thank you for a very, uh, very thorough uh, answer there, sir. Uh, I'll take a couple questions from the audience. Uh, so first, right down here in front. Uh, hold on a second. We got a microphone coming so our audience uh, on the computer can hear. If you could state uh, your name, where you're from, and then your question, please. Sure, my name is Kevin Wensing. I'm a retired Navy captain. I used to work with the secretary. Uh, there's two other sort of battlefields of uh, space, which we're much more dependent on now than we were 30 years ago, and now the Arctic, which is a new potential area of interest. So I'd like your comments on those two areas. Well, I, I, uh, I think that the uses of the Arctic are overblown. Uh, it's never going to be a real game changer in the in commercial uh, activity. Uh, since the Northwest Passage uh, uh, and the, uh, the Northern Arctic Passage opened up, there's only been one container ship that's ever bothered to use it. And uh, when, you, when you can't use things all year round, then you do not get the benefits of liner, uh, these large container and tanker and, and so forth. So um, 
I don't worry too much about that. Our capability of our submarine force to command those under seas, under ice areas, is where we have to worry because we have not been spending sufficient money on ASW, and the Russians have. Uh, and so um, I, I, I really uh, uh, I don't worry too much uh, uh, about, uh, about the Arctic. And the other area is space. Uh, question, do we need a, an independent space command? Um, I, I, as everybody knows, uh, having been a, a, a very vocal opponent of the centralization uh, of uh, Goldwater Nichols and other, quote, reforms, I believe in, in decentralized uh, management, not centralized management. And, and so uh, it, making an independent space command uh, could make sense if it were done right, but it won't be done right. It, it'll just, <laughs> yeah. It, it, instead of being a devolved, efficient, more efficient uh, uh, service, it, it'll just become another layer of bureaucracy, another layer of delay. Every reform of centralization uh, since, uh, since the Korean War has added additional years to how long it takes. As everybody knows, you know, I'm, uh, I've been the kind of uh, crazy uncle in the attic on this. <laughs> um, the, you know, the Polaris program and the Minuteman program were tremendous breakthroughs in technology. They took, the Polaris took uh, from the, literally the back of an envelope uh, concept over a lunch from that until the deployment of the George Washington on its first fully operational strategic cruise was four years. And that involved designing a new submarine, a new uh, uh, launching system, new solid fuel propellant, new uh, guidance system, inertial guidance for the submarine, and a totally different one uh, for the missile uh, warheads a new data bus, a new warhead, and uh, all that was done in four years with slide rules. Today, the average time for an ACAT one or two program, uh, and for the Navy Department, that's over 100, the average time now is about 23 years to get to travel that same distance. Just for the reformed Goldwater Nichols approved uh, uh, requirements through the JROC and approved by uh, the, the bureaucracy, just the paper that says we could use this is five and a half years for the ACAT one and two programs. And so, you know, that in, in many ways, that's the biggest threat. And that's why I, I, I don't think the Space Command makes sense because while it could, if it were done right, it will not be done right. It will be another layer of bureaucracy that'll take the ACAT one and two programs from 23 years, <laughs> at least to 25 years. Thank you. I think I saw another uh, gentleman in the white shirt there. Thank you. Sir, uh, Carl Golovin, retired special agent, US Customs, 9-11 responder, domain reference and idea, liveson.net. Uh, sir, you were, uh, thank you for your leadership, and you were introduced as uh, a 9-11 Commission member, a very important duty, and um, as a responder, I have to take the opportunity to ask you, I helped sift the rubble of World Trade Center 7, the third tower of 47 stories that collapsed that day, uh, which tends to undermine the official story. There's since come out evidence of controlled demolition in that tower as well as 1 and 2, which your commission was led to not even mention World Trade Center 7 in your report. Also, I understand that you had abundant information about Saudi involvement, but you were led perhaps by certain FBI elements to not draw conclusions about that. So, I, sir, I previously asked you this at the Institute of World Politics. You gave very informative responses, but they redacted my question and your very informative responses from their record of that. So I'd please ask you to inform the public with your answers on these important issues. Thank you. Well, uh, I, uh, I am agnostic on, on the Building 7 issue. Um, and uh, 
the reason I'm agnostic is I, uh, I, I believe the response that was made uh, with regard to the sources of uh, that attack uh, were sufficient under the case and that um, it, it would not make a huge difference if we found that there were other people uh, in, involved uh, because those other people would not uh, have distracted, I mean, the investigation from the source of this. Uh, and, uh, and the conclusions we drew was that uh, the layering of, of the bureaucracy and the stovepipes uh, prevented the sharing of information uh, and it I think we, we, we made the right recommendations um, to, to tear down those layers um, and, and uh, really have more sh sharing of key information, uh, the source uh, uh, of the uh, uh, of those uh, attacks, uh, I'm, I'm sure many of you have read uh, The Looming Tower or seen the excellent movie about it. Uh, there, uh, uh, there was a blindness, uh, you know, after uh, that our system and the refusal to share is most dramatically illustrated by uh, when the, uh, uh, the first attack of the Blind Sheikh's uh, group, which was really Al-Qaeda, the precursors to Al-Qaeda, uh, the information, the director of CIA at the time told me face to face that he was not allowed to look at the evidence that had been gathered by the FBI and the NYPD because it was under seal because it, 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 there had been a grand jury convened. And for five years of trial and uh, appeals, the president was not allowed to see, uh, the director of CIA was not allowed to see, uh, because this was uh, a prosecution. Had we seen that, it very, once it was finally, when the convictions and the last appeals were over and it was released, you could see exactly what the, the source of, uh, of this threat. It was Al-Qaeda, and it was well embedded into the New York uh, 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 community. And uh, after that, uh, and, and so we could have stopped 9-11. We could have stopped it if, if the sharing of the information that CIA had had been shared with FBI. So, whether or not one more building uh, uh, it was sabotaged rather than collateral damage, or whether there were charges planted uh, in, in the World Trade Center, I'm personally skeptical. You know more about it a lot than I am, and you, were, you are a believer. But I don't think it would ultimately have made much difference. Uh, we would found a few more miscreants, but that's not the name of the game, and that's what that is what has brought us to this day. The FBI, you know, most of us in the 9-11 Commission believe the FBI should be split like every European intelligence agency. And MI5, MI5 in the UK, the FBI equivalent, does not have, have prosecutorial powers. They're not cops. They're intelligence people. And we are the only uh, country that has... Uh, that gives the domestic intelligence to the guys who are promoted uh, by getting indictments. And so, you know, this is, I thought, best illustrated when I asked in one of the televised programs, asked the FBI director, there are these six Saudi employees, which gets to your Saudi, uh, and it's very clear that they were helped, they, they, these People came in through Canada, some of them, went straight to this, uh, the uh, Saudi mosque in L.A. Uh, they were given money and given uh, 
uh, given uh, support, uh, found apartments. They were then moved down to San Diego to the Saudi uh, mosque in, in San Diego where they were helped to get into flight school and so forth. We had the names of all of these people. And they were clearly helping, knowledgeably helping, the, the, uh, 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 the, the hijackers. Uh, where are they now? And uh, the director said, we don't know where they are. And I said, why? Why don't you know where? I mean, this is, uh, would seem to be a pretty high priority. And he said, no, we investigated them and we found insufficient evidence to indict them. So we dropped the case. That's the FBI. If you can't get a, if you can't get a, a conviction, you're not gonna, you're wasting your time. And, and that's still a fundamental flaw of our, of our system. And as to the Saudis' involvement, uh, we all know now, at least a lot of it has leaked out some of the, uh, the intelligence we had then, and it's now pretty much public knowledge of the protection racket that, uh, that goes on between the Wahhabists and the government. I don't think the government uh, 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 had real knowledge of the attack. They didn't want to know. But, you know, a substantial portion of the, uh, of the Saudi budget still goes to the Wahhabist establishment. The new crown prince, I think, is a very different uh, a, a change of direction with regard, and that's why the Wahhabists are so uh, upset about him. And it could mean a finally a fundamental change that uh, would take the, the Saudi uh, arrangement out of uh, support of, of jihadism. One, uh, one final question uh, down here in front. Wait, wait, so, 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 the, so our audience can hear. I'm an active duty Navy officer on a fellowship to Congressman Joe Courtney over in the House. Uh, you ended your comments saying there's a, a need for a visible Navy that's deployed around the world showing the flag. I was hoping you could comment on Secretary Mattis's concept of dynamic force employment, which means having ships deploy less, keeping them closer to home at a higher state of readiness. When they do deploy, it's very unpredictable. Perhaps they're not going as far, they're not as visible. That seems to counter somewhat with your comments. I was hoping you, you could discuss that further. Thanks. Uh, I support uh, General Mattis's uh, view on this. Uh, we've been trying with too small a fleet to, to be too many places, and that's been leading to a disaster. Uh, and uh, there, the deployment schedules have been unbearable. We're starting to see, well, not starting, we're well into seeing exactly what happened in the late 70s, where uh, the people that you need to train, the stiff arm chiefs and the uh, technicians, uh, are not re-upping. Uh, or they're getting out the minute they hit their 20-year uh, mark. Uh, they, uh, um, uh, they just, their, their families won't, won't put up with it. And uh, these back-to-back -back deployments, eight, nine months, before, you know, during, during the 70s, we got to 11-month deployments. And that's when we started not to be able to uh, deploy ships. We had four ships in, in, uh, in 80 that could not deploy because they didn't have sufficient minimal uh, troops. The backlog for overhauls was over 55 or so of, uh, of ships awaiting and unfunded overhauls. Uh, so uh, yes, we have, to, we have to find a balance uh, you can still have presence without taking a full battle group uh, out because most of the time they, um, uh, you know, for the signaling and the visible deterrence, uh, you know, our battle groups deployed with 18 to 20 some ships back in, in the 80s, and they needed them. And we really need something like that now if we were to really face uh, the kind of ASW threat uh, and, and missile threat that uh, the Russians can deploy in certain limited areas. Uh, 
uh, because we're, I think we're, if there's one area where we're really behind, it's not missile defense, it's, uh, it's uh, ASW. We have let the uh, SOSA systems uh, erode to, uh, uh, well, I won't go too far into it, but way beyond where they should have been allowed to erode. We, the Soviets have concentrated their limited resources. It's important to understand that, you know, as John McCain always used to say, you know, this is a, a gas station with an economy the size of Denmark. Well, actually, it's just a little bigger than Denmark today. It's about the size of New York State. And we are probably 15 times the economy of Russia. And yet, we're beginning to be intimidated by them the way, uh, the way NATO was back in the Cold War. So we have to be realistic about what our, our, where our threats come from. The biggest threat from Russia is that, uh, that this guy has really focused his, his attention on where he thinks our greatest vulnerability is militarily. And that is in his submarine capability and his ASW. Uh, he is now reportedly in the press uh, uh, tapping our cables and uh, mapping where he can cut all the internet cables and so forth with his submarines. I guess we showed him how to do it. Now they're, they're, uh, uh, they're deploying very, very capable submarines. Uh, I think the real vulnerability then and now, uh, the same, is their new subs when they come out uh, of the building docks and first deploy are formidable. They've got the best technology developed by us, but not all. Uh, they've got some very good technology centers. But they, uh, their second uh, deployment is a little noisier. And the third deployment is very noisy because they, uh, they, they really don't have the trained people and they don't have the infrastructure to maintain the kind of complexity needed particularly for submarines because, it, it, you know, as you know, keeping a submarine quiet is an art. Uh, and um, so, uh, but they are much more of a threat than, uh, than we are currently best prepared to deal with. And, uh, and those are the areas I think we've got to really uh, straighten up. Thank you. I thank you all for coming today. Uh, Secretary Lane will be available for a few minutes for anyone who uh, wants him to sign uh, sign books. And I uh, thank you again all for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.